Some of our people, Jim said, Jim loved to call our students, undergraduates and graduates alike, our people. Some of our people, Kirsty, don't want to be that don't want to write poetry, but they want to be poets. It was Jim himself in his lovely quiet way who taught me from the start that there's a difference between having an idea about yourself and the actual hard graft of doing it. He knew more about that, I think, than anybody else I know. I had the great, great pleasure, honour and joyousness of setting up and establishing and then running the writing practice and study program at Dundee for 10 years or more with the late Jim Stewart. A time of energy, of high creativity, of intellectual inquiry, and of endless discussions about poetry and literature and our people. Jim himself, while he knew a great deal about those differences, the poem, the writing of the poem, and the act of being a poet, quietly and in his own way, was working on a body of poetry all his life. While he made that distinction to me, he also had told me earlier that from a very young age, he knew he wanted to be a poet. But by that, he didn't mean what so many people think of as having a role in life that may require some kind of ego, that involves uh, the putting about of self, uh, the claiming for one's work on top of the work as it exists. No, what Jim meant was that he knew from an early age how to see and how to attend and how to make of his thoughts something creative and beautiful and new. In this beautiful collection we're here to celebrate tonight, this, the poet Jim Stewart shows the world around us in all of its detail, with all of the fine attention that that boy who knew for all those years that this is what he wanted to do, could bring to each and every single poem that we read pressed between the pages of this volume, this. By attending to the poems, we retrieve the poet. And we have tonight in our midst, through this beautiful collection of his, Jim Stewart comes back to us again. So if for no other reason than uh, a chance to remember a great colleague, a wonderful friend, and a fine, fine poet, then tonight is that time. We're going to have a really lovely evening tonight. We've got some terrific poets, well-known poets. We have friends of Jim. We have those he loved and were close to, all reading from a selection of this volume that we're here to celebrate. And I'm now, with great pleasure, going to turn proceedings over to my colleague, Eddie Small, who's going to introduce all of our readers in turn. Thank you all so very much for being part of this. Like everybody here, I have memories of Jim. The, the, the foremost memory is the pace that Jim would walk at. Even <laughs> with a sore knee, I could beat Jim across the road any time. But there was one day I remember Jim was in a particular hurry, very unusual. And he was in a hurry because he was going to listen to Beth McDonough doing a reading and he didn't want to miss a minute. And I think it's incredibly apt that the first reader tonight is going to be the same Beth. One of his people, one of his favourite people. Beth is going to read us Oyster Catchers. Thank you. Oyster catchers. For long after dark and before first light, a clamorous pair of oyster catchers courts in an echoing circumference of air and sky. Anxiously they whoop and wheel by day, by night. The repetitions mean that she's in season and will concede his ancient cry that seed should not be lost makeshift, a nest will be let and brooded on. Their squeal jitters pulled in yoke in the hot work of embryos. Their keening need 
will fold its sound. Bread and the humid shells they'll make to shift and free, peculiar as themselves, new birds. Can't listen to that without seeing that face and, and, and the noise here. That's incredible. Thank you. Uh, let's move on to one half of the double act that was Jim Stewart and Andy Jackson attended more of their joint readings than I can even tell you, and they were always priceless. Andy, would you now read Field for us, please? Just a quick thank you to uh, Gail and Kirsty and the team with a handsome volume, uh, and I've even done my best to put black on tonight. <laughs> Field. Maybe healing gets a start in the ordered natural. The fallow peace, center of the present fiction, was unbroken, unharrowed twelve months. In its bounds, ladybirds lagged grass blades with their blood. Still cocooned membranes spun a bitter light into familiar colors. Earwigs tended eggs and all hatched to the suffered balm of their enclosure. True bread, love left the soul to think about the sedges in the grass of this walled garden. Plumbed devotion heard circling oyster catchers peep, a scutter in the copses, hoops and alleys. There, across the fence, the sudden Yellow darkness must occlude as a brimstone floated off into the wood. It's gorgeous, Andy, thank you. I really do get um, I think a remarkable man is how well he gets some of his colleagues. The probably bigger mark is how well Jim got on with colleagues past. People who had been there never forgot Jim. And Marion, I'd like you, Marion Windows, if you would come and Give us your reading. Um, Blackbird. Oh. Okay, well that's made me fill up, hasn't it? Because yes, Jim, Jim was a past colleague, and I've not been, and not lived here now for eleven years. That he was like, he was just a mate. Okay, he was just a mate, and so I am proud, proud that I did that by Dave and Kirsty to read one of the poems tonight. So I'm reading Blackbird. The blackbird carves a space among the trees. Blows aren't needed, but it chips the flakes of rival presences in territory hammered out by a heavy, chiselled sound. It isn't always quite so artisan. Mid-morning, half a dozen flip the fallen mats of beech leaf thinning across the winter grass, equally distant. Clinking only starts at morning twilight, or when a slow disk falls, foraging not started for the day, or over and done with. Then comes this vexing of un filled space that cannot be shared. When light and dark throw into doubt whose area was whose. For the world turns its back on former shape in the new air and only by a clamorous sculpting's attack of sound on memory <laughs> that any exact the latent form of a place's coordinates centered as if on them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
to me well up, well done. That was extremely well done. Um, let's move to family now. The great thing about Jim is he shared his family with us. Yeah, we really did. We all knew Ros and Marilla and Jeff so very well. So Marilla's going to come up now. Um, Marilla's going to give us Sycamore. Please bear with me, I drew the short straw among the family to read. Um, I have to be honest, I'm not a huge fan of poetry, so I probably should not be stood here. I'm sorry, Uncle Jim. Um, but I, I love him absolutely dearly and miss him every day. So, Uncle Jim wrote Sycamores, which was dedicated to my mum and Rosalind Fogdell. So, first they opened their fat green baby wings, the air approving on the side of this riding flock of seedlings taking a habitation in its stride. So many seeds had hatched here in one go, lift off looked inevitable, but they wouldn't all find space in which to grow. For any flight path opening, some shut. Within the week, twin leaves reared a deeper, a darker green. Their deep systemic veins were adult business. When these appeared, they, fe they fielded a fleet of weather veins. Finger tested the compasses four ways to know what side the wind would fly. It mattered to them all their wooden days are a breezy symbiosis till they die. <clears throat> Air insisted everything its own. Its weight can make the snowdrop droop, the crocus curve, and bends the will of bone, struggling to resist it or regroup. All that grows is canted to its lust, swaying elastically within the sound. Hen, bending back or forward as it must, if the lift is not to snap the bow. Wind which takes <coughs> the the way does not seek to murder but to shape. Its torque day by coercive day, limiting the chances of escape. The sick pours too, knowing to defy the onrush of that necessary rhyme, sank their roots and raised their branches high, grew forcible and bided time. And came at last to the years when they would seed, when pale propellers turning among the leaf, torsion and ratio to need, would hang in the air, unpowered to belief. When rose to the occasion too, an hour of wonder was afoot. It settled and conceded to the resourcefulness of fruit. Brown blade stiffened to the rest, to the test, and filled with the truth of trees. Bracks matched their potion and double in their quest for earth and air detached. This was the way their know-how surfed the very air, making good their difference from the breezes they had earthed by all the airy enterprise of wood. Mm -hmm. For somebody who doesn't like poetry, did that just this. I remember Jim the first time we met. So this is my niece Marilla, she doesn't like poetry. <laughs> so absolutely true. You'll like her, she doesn't like poetry. <laughs> that, was, that was superb. Can we move on to another one of Jim's people? Jim has quite a number of people and I can see them dotted around all over the place. I'm one of Jim's people. And one, this is one of Jim's people is going to read next. Sue Haig, would you come up and you're going to read us trees. Thank you. <coughs> I was really pleased that Kirsty asked me to read this poem because Jim and I often talked about trees, especially when he was poet in residence at Tents Muir. And I have this special um, attachment to, to trees and always have had. But hearing these poems tonight um, actually reminds me of um, a saying that Jim, an oft quoted saying by Jim, um, what he used to say was, I'll be teaching at this university long after I'm dead. And that is absolutely true. He is still teaching at this university, the other university. <clears throat> trees. The trees are dreaming of birds. Dreaming their berries are gobbled by a race with not a minute to live rendered down to seed, and then shut carelessly through indifferent air. 
in a falling feeling coupled with a splattering sensation who knows where. They never waken. Torpor guards their drift to other landscapes, other earth. Somehow they must sleep themselves to birth. And all trees have to dream about is this. I've never met the next person, and she's never met me, but I know her intimately well. I once shared a flight around America with Jim, and he would get out on his lap within minutes of being in the air, this book on Virginia Woolf, because he was doing this project with Emma Sutton, and then he would fall asleep within seconds, and for the next four hours, I would be reading this thing and writing in my head this thing for Emma Sutton. I wondered who this Emma Sutton was that kept me up, and now I'm going to meet her. Emma, would you come and read Feather for us? Thank you. Um, I'm really touched to be included and touched by those words. Um, uh, as has just been said, Jim, Jim and I spent the best part of a decade editing Virginia Woolf's first novel together. It's still not finished, but it's, that project has enriched my life immensely. And like everyone here, I miss Jim very much. Feather. Some breath lost this. The need passed, it hinders no flight, means no heat loss. Plenty others keep out the cold or spread the flush of bird blood. It's fix on flesh wrong at the root, too odd to hang along, loosening wind undid the tie, or while the pecked ground gave grist for a crop. Shaft and barb idle in a corner's draught, not light like the air, nor riding a wind which plucks and shifts in the old way. If it's not finished, then I still have notes <laughs> in the flight to Boston, if you want them, they're over here. So they're extremely well done. Thank you very, very much. Um, the best poetry performance I ever attended was in St Paul's uh, Cathedral in Dundee. Um, Jim stood there, surrounded by iconography, looking much more a saint than any of the heads around me. And that day I was privileged to hear Jim at his best, along with Andy Jackson at his best, and somebody I didn't know very well, it's Don Wood, and, and I was mesmerised by all three of you for different reasons, and tonight I think we're so lucky to have Don Wood come and read something of just waterfall. Thank you. I can definitely see Jim smiling at us from these pages. Waterfall. This is a quick and easy passage down, and freely overgoverned by its fall into the water where you cannot drown. It gushes from the marsh's shallow brown, a purity that's hardly stained at all. This is a quick and easy passage down of tribute, rashly pouring from the crown, homage to itself but past recall into the water where you cannot drown. Glossing more is verb than passive noun, the rushing of its gerunds in control, this is a quick and easy passage down. So long as marginalia expound this rhetoric, receding down its wall into the water where you cannot drown, and nuance isn't free to play around with surplus syllables at large or small, this is a quick and easy passage down into the water where you cannot drown. We can drown, honestly, in the, in the words that were amazing. You know, tonight we could have had so many people who are gathered here tonight who could have read something and would have done it extremely well. Um, there isn't a day passes when Kirsty's in the university that we, and Gail, we don't discuss Jim. There isn't a week that passes when some student or other mentions Jim to me. It's such a huge impact. But he didn't just have impact on his people. He had an impact on a lady who shared Virginia Woolf and so many other things. And a love affair as well. Jim, would you finish this by giving us this? Thank you. 
Thank you. It's a real honour to read Jim's poems. I've spent two decades talking with Jim about Virginia Woolf. He's my soulmate in Wolf Studies. When he was dying in hospital, I was taking notes from him about a minor theological point in Virginia Woolf's <laughs> Time Passes. And uh, we often shared an observation by Woolf Intellectual freedom depends upon material things. And that translates in the life of a poet very much into the quiddity of language. And I'm so pleased to read this poem, this, which reflects on the, and embodies the hecaity, the quiddity of a poet's language. This is this and this only. How the kestrel knows air, not as the owl knows it or the wasp. What's what is this? The bat flying near blind in the wake of its sound. And also this, a slight movement in the grass caught in its history. Not lovely. We've come to the eighth of eight poems that were selected. As I said, we could add so many more. Um, I don't want this to stop particularly, but it, all great things do come to an end. Um, I'm sure if Jim were here tonight, he'd be quite embarrassed by what we're doing tonight. <laughs> but I'm sure he loved it in his own way. Never met anybody that, at our university that has more time for his people, his students, than Jim. And, and it worked both ways. Um, there's so many people here tonight who simply loved Jim, and I am one of them. Thank you all for attending tonight. There will be books at the top and other messages I've got to pass. What else is happening? Gail will tell you she's much better than me. I mean, this has been a real collaborative, convivial job that we've, we've um, undertaken to put the collection together. Um, we've had really passionate arguments over what to put in, what not to put in, over the cover, over the weight of the paper, over the font size. This has been a real labour of love.